He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Hi, Stephen Price here. Just a warning, this podcast contains violence and quite a bit of bad language, so take care of yourself while you're listening. Hello? Yeah, good day, Dave. Yeah. Paul Rivers here, how you doing? You good, mate? Paul Rivers is an architectural draftsman. David Little hired him to draw up the plans for the house he was building, the house for Brett Hall up at Pitangi. But now, Brett has disappeared, and the police have been talking to both of them. So Paul calls up David Little and records the conversation. It's possible he's been put up to this by the police. He tells David that about a month before he disappeared, Brett came to see him. He just turned up here one morning out of the blue, eh? Uninvited, didn't ring or anything first. And he just turned up and he, 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 he fucking had it in for you, eh? He was real unhappy with you. Why is that? And the, bottom, the bottom line is that he, he told me that... Um, that you and him had entered into this, uh, entered into uh, building this building that I did the plans for. Yeah. Um, on a labour-only situation, and that that you, but you were still going to use your account to um, to get all the materials cheap because of the, you know, the your your account discount, and um, and that while everything was still being purchased for your account, you weren't supposed to be putting any markup on it, but he reckons that you did, and he reckons you did to the tune of um, a hell of a lot of money. David Little had been getting two price lists for materials for Brett's house. One with his builder's discount, and one at full retail price. Looks like that's the one he gave Brett. Brett found out and got angry. He thought he was being ripped off. But was he? It turns out it's not uncommon for builders to pocket the margin on the building materials. Other tradies do too. As David puts it... Oh, he's talking shit. Oh, there's two sides to every story. Yeah, that's right. You've got to make a bit of profit out of it or you're not going to bother doing it. Still, rightly or wrongly, it's pretty clear that Brett was mad at David. That's why he marched into Paul Rivers' office. Brett also talked to his brother Michael about it. Um, well, he's, he was a, um, a bit pissed off. You know, he's, you know, he wasn't very happy about the situation. Um, he was going to give David a dong. A dong? Beat him up, give him a hiding. Beat him up. Give him a hiding. Had things gotten that bad? Was David Little worried Brett was going to thrash him? Did David Little get in first? Did he kill Brett? I'm Stephen Price, and this is Mr Little Meets Mr Big, the podcast about whether police can use a story to get to the truth about a murder. In earlier episodes, we looked inside the Mr Big sting that led David Little to confess to murder and wondered how reliable that confession was. Then, just as the trial was getting underway, the judge called it off because of the awful police failures to turn over evidence to the defence. In this episode, at last, we get to the full trial. In fact, you've already been hearing snippets from it. What really happened? Will the rest of the evidence give us the full story? People do make false confessions. That is a fact. All he's given me is 1800 bucks, and he was not happy. I'll be happy once this all blows over. Well, once they bloody find him. Well, I don't think they will, though. Let's back up a bit and set the scene for the trial. You'll remember Brett Hall went missing in May 2011. There was no trace of him at his campsite up the Pitangi track in the backwoods of Whanganui. Just an open caravan door, an empty rifle case, and a quad bike parked up the hill by the bush. Oh, and the frame of the house that David Little had been building there for Brett. That was there too. Brett had been suspicious that David was ripping him off. Police began to wonder if the dispute had turned deadly. David's answers to police questions weren't stacking up and he struggled to explain his odd driving in the early hours of the weekend Brett had disappeared. On the other hand, there was growing evidence that Brett had been involved in drug dealing that weekend. Was that what got him killed? Police thought David Little did it, but they didn't have enough evidence to charge him. So as we've seen, three years later, in 2014, they ran a Mr Big sting on him. And at the end, he confessed. The sting gave him lots of reasons to make up a confession but it also gave him reasons to tell the truth. What will the jury think when they hear both sides of the story? Mr Little, can you please stand? 
David Owen Little, you were charged that on the 27th day of May 2011 at Whanganui murdered Breton Roy Hall. How do you plead, guilty or not guilty? I'm at the trial. This time it's at the Wellington High Court. It's October 2019, eight years after Brett went missing. David Little's behind a glass screen beside two corrections officers. The jury, six men and six women, sit in the jury box along the side wall. Justice Jill Mallon is at the raised bench at the front of the court. The lawyers for the Crown and the defence sit at tables in the middle, facing the judge. They're surrounded by rows of ring binders festooned with coloured post-its. They have little cups of water. The judge and the lawyers wear black gowns. Any blokes on the media bench, like me, have to wear ties. The atmosphere in the courtroom is thin, surgical. There are no windows. It's all business here. We're here to observe the drama of the trial, but there's a bigger story being told between the lines. It's about justice and how we reckon with it. We are dispassionate, serious, fair. Court is a kabuki of respect and civility. Language is formal. Jokes are rare. Outbursts are frowned on. It's as if we've had to leave our emotions at the door so they won't get in the way of our intense focus on the evidence. There are rules about what we're not allowed to take into account, like hearsay. But in the end, how we decide on guilt on justice is by a contest of stories. At the core of our system of justice is the rule that guilt must be proved beyond reasonable doubt. The judge explains that to the jury. But she also tells them to take special care when they look at David Little's apparent confession at the end of the Mr Big Sting. It's a warning. It's as if the law doesn't trust the stories we tell ourselves about what confessions mean. People do make false confessions. That is a fact. Strange as it may seem, people do confess to something they actually haven't done. There are many proven examples around the world of it happening, and they have happened in relation to serious charges like this. The Crown Prosecutor is Michelle Wilkinson-Smith. She has her story too. It's a story about a guilty man who should be punished. It's got to be a complete story, seamless, waterproof. She opens the case by asking the jury to think hard about some questions that are the Crown's main plot points. Who was the last person seen with Brett Hall? Who has been less than truthful about the guns at Petangi? Who said Brett Hall was alive on the Sunday, when clearly he was missing, by the early Saturday morning at least? Who was driving around the Turakina and Bull Coast in the early hours of Sunday morning trying to access the beach? Whose account of what he did on the Sunday changed and developed as he was confronted with more and more evidence, more and more CCTV footage? Who led police to .22 and .223 ammunition and a .22 silencer hidden at a cemetery near his house? Who confessed to killing Brett Hall to undercover officers? Hmm, that would be David Little. Next, it's the defence's turn to open. Their story is of a man unjustly accused who needs to be vindicated. Their story doesn't need to be complete, they can just pick holes in the prosecution story. But it helps if they have a convincing narrative of their own. The defence lawyers say Brett and David Little were getting on well. David was making a good job of the house, and when Brett went missing, David was very cooperative with police. They say Brett was a drug dealer, had dangerous friends, and there's evidence that a deal was going down that weekend, and it ended badly for Brett. Here's defence lawyer Christopher Stevenson. Our case is David Little is absolutely innocent, and Bretton Hall probably lost his life in that high-risk drug underworld he'd chosen to be a part of. The theatre of the trial, with its scenes and subplots and multiple points of view, lasts nine and a half weeks. So my story's pretty selective. These are the bits that I think are important. Some of this is not in the order it happened at the trial, but I've arranged it so that it mostly follows an order of what happened at the time of Brett's disappearance. Let's go back to that phone call to David Little from Paul Rivers, the guy who drafted the plans for Brett Hall's house. Remember, Paul Rivers is telling David that Brett came to see him about a month before he went missing. So around April 2011, maybe early May. And he said Brett was upset with David, thinking he was ripping him off. The idea was that um, you had put a mark up on the materials when you weren't supposed to. He says 
that looks bad for David. Yeah, because you, you'd be in a bad position there thinking about it with the fact that, you know, you, um, about the time that he went missing, um, you and him weren't getting on very well over, you know, building a house. To be honest, it was never even mentioned to me, mate. We got on box of birds. I've never ever argued with Brett. Yeah. Hey, my wife told the police that. We've never ever said a bad word to each other in all our life. Yeah. David Little tells him he doesn't know anything about Brett's disappearance, but he's pretty sure it's all about drugs, and now he's being blamed for it. He had too much money, that's the problem. Yeah. Anything could have happened. David says he's getting sick of all the suspicion from the police. It must have been a horrible experience for you to uh, be caught up with something like that. Oh, fuck yeah, it puts me off, mate. Because it hasn't ended either. That's the problem. David just wants it all to be finished with. I'll be happy once this all blows over. Well, once they bloody find him. Well, I don't think they will, though. Hmm. Why was David so sure Brett would not be found? About a month before he disappeared, Brett was mad at David. He complained that he'd paid David a lot of money, but David was taking too long, ripping him off, not paying for materials. Brett started visiting the roofing and window supplies himself. He told his brother he'd beat David up, get someone else to finish the job. Sometime around then, Brett calls David to a meeting at Brett's mother Lavona's house. Prosecutor Michelle Wilkinson-Smith asks her about it. What did Brett want? Well, he wanted the money back that he'd given Dave and hadn't yet been spent on the house, on buying materials. And <coughs> what happened about that? Did, did he get any money from Mr. Well, Little? Dave left and he came back a little while later. Brett answered the door and um, he shut the door and came out to me and sort of held out his hand and he said, all he's given me is 1800 bucks. He said, 1800 And he was not happy. Later on, police found a note in Brett's handwriting that Brett may have written for David around the same time. It said, Not paying any more money until house is built. I want you there when building inspector visits. Not paying any wages to anyone you bring up can come out of the money that I've paid you. If Brett was angry at David Little over his building work, he wasn't the only one. Melanie Brown was having similar experiences with David in the same year, 2011. The Browns had hired David to put in a deck, shift a fireplace and build an extension. Melanie Brown said the deck and the fireplace went well, but it took David ages to get around to the extension. Then, she says, he asked for money for windows. And what did he tell you about what stage they were at? Um, Well, first of all, we needed the deposit for them to be started to be made, and then later he asked for the rest of the money so that the windows could be picked up and ready to go. Did he tell you whether they were ready? Yes, he said they were ready, which is why I paid the rest of the window money to him. Did you ever see those windows? Never. They never turned up. It turned out David had been spending most of the money she gave him for windows and building materials on his family's living costs. Anyone who saw David's bank account wouldn't be surprised. His financial situation was dire. In May 2011, with work on the Browns' extension and Brett's house still lined up, his own mortgage payments were bouncing. He'd taken money from both of them for windows that he hadn't bought. And in fact, I can tell you something that the jury never got to hear about. David Little was convicted for fraud for deceiving the Browns. Was he doing the same thing to Brett? You can see the Crown's story coming together. David Little was desperate. He was underwater financially. He'd been keeping afloat with payments from the Browns and Brett, money that should have been going on building materials. Brett found out, was getting angry. It was all coming to a head. There was a building inspection coming up for Brett's house, and the Crown said it was going to fail. Even if it passed, David would have to come up with the money for the windows, money he didn't have. Brett was known to have a temper. What would Brett do to him when he found out? Maybe it was better to get in first. That all looks pretty bad for David Little. But the defence tell the story differently. Sure, there were delays with the building projects. David was recovering from a serious shoulder injury. He had surgery early in 2011. He was getting ACC and was on doctor's orders to keep his workload light. Yes, Brett made David repay some of the money he'd given David for materials. And he also picked up and paid for some materials himself. 
But that didn't mean David was keeping all his money. Far from it. He bought the timber, the flooring, the cladding. Here's a worker from Bunnings telling defence lawyer Elizabeth Hall he remembers David buying building supplies for Brett's house. Uh, yeah, I remember him bringing in uh, $10,000 in 20s um, to pay for a large order we had for him. And, um, and did, you see the, did you see the money? Yep. And what did it look like to you? Big stack of green notes, like a big brick. And, um, and what was that for? Uh, that was for an order I believe we were delivering um, to him for the hunting hut. The hunting hut. That was Brett's house at Pitangi. Now, it's true that David was spending some of Brett's materials money on his living expenses, same as he was for the Browns. And he may well have lied to them about this. But, and here's the thing, he says he was never trying to go back on his promises. He told the police, the deal was the deal. You always meant to do the work, finish the job, buy the materials, find the money somewhere. He knew that was his obligation. He wasn't duping them into giving him money for things he was never going to buy. It's just that the money went into his account and money for his family's living expenses came out. Things got tight, but he still knew he had to finish the job. The deal was the deal. Remember that fraud conviction I told you about for ripping off the Browns? David Little appealed. And at the heart of his appeal was that exact point. He wasn't deceiving the Browns because he always intended that the deal was the deal. And the judge agreed. She found that maybe David did genuinely believe he could use the money as he saw fit, as long as he ultimately did the work for the agreed price. She said it wasn't clear he was being criminally dishonest. She overturned the conviction. So, maybe that's what he was doing with Brett, too. Doesn't seem like a big stretch. David Little would not be the first tradesman who tried to bluster his way through a financial jam on the expectation of money from future jobs. So what was the deal between Brett and David? The best evidence seems to be another handwritten note found in Brett's possessions. It shows that David was to build the house for $70,000 all up, including building materials. On the note, money that Brett was giving David for materials was being subtracted off the $70,000. David was to get the balance at the end for his labour. As the judge said later, that's a pretty good deal for Brett. If you think about it, That means it doesn't really matter what David was charging Brett for materials. If David was pocketing the markup now, that just meant there'd be less of the $70,000 left for him at the end. I'm not sure Brett looked at it that way, though. Here's what David told police. He thought you were ripping him off. No, he didn't. Well, he might have to a certain extent, but it was a greed price. It didn't matter what happened. It was getting done for that 70-something thousand bucks. This is quite a different story to the Crown's one. This one's about a builder with an injured shoulder who gets behind on his work and falls into a financial hole because he makes deals where he doesn't get paid until the work's finished. That sounds like a guy who wants to finish the building so he can get paid. It doesn't sound like a guy who wants to kill the bloke who's going to pay him. Now, it's clear that Brett did get mad at David and confront him about the materials and the delays. He told his probation officer that he was looking at getting another builder and wanted to try to get his money back from David. But by the middle of May, their relationship, and a house project, seemed to be back on track. David said he'd paid Brett $10,000 back for the windows, though it's not clear he really did. Still, their texts were friendly, and here's Brett's probation officer, Rachel Potter. So the 18th of May was quite a change. Um, He was a lot more positive. Um, He came and said that there'd been heaps of progress on the building, Um, and he was hoping to have the council through on Monday for a second inspection. Um, So I had an impression that things were back on track. The 18th of May. That's nine days before the Crown says David killed Brett. Before we get to the crucial few days when Brett disappeared, there are a few things the Crown wants us to know about him. Early on in the trial, we learn about Brett and his lifestyle from his family, his mother, his brother and his son. As we'll see... It's his son Damien whose evidence is the most important. Damien's in his 20s, sports a dark beard and wears tidy jeans and a puffy jacket. His answers are confident and occasionally droll. And how would you describe him as a dad? What was he, what was he like? Oh, really good. Um, yeah, well, the only one I ever had. He was, he was great. Damien explains that he lived in Whanganui and was very close to his father, seeing him every weekend or two. Since he was a kid, they'd often go hunting and camping together. 
Hunting was a bit risky for Brett now, though. Remember, he's on parole for serious drug offences. He wasn't allowed guns or drugs. Damien describes how seriously Brett took this. I, I left a bullet in the caravan once, uh, <coughs> about a month or so before he went missing. Um, it was an accident. I, I must have, I don't know how it got left there, but I left it there. Uh, and he came in to town to my house and he handed me the bullet with a, with a dad face saying um, that they could put him back inside. He said if, if he gets caught with that up there, he'll go back to jail. And yeah, sternly told me to, to sort it out, don't do it again. Damien says when he visited Brett up at Pitangi, he'd sleep in the plywood shed. Brett would be in the caravan beside it. They'd cook on a little gas stove or sometimes on the campfire. Brett parked a couple of Toyota Hiluxes nearby, a red one and a white one, though Damien said he'd never seen Brett use the white one, which needed a bit of work. Brett also had a new quad bike that he used to check his possum traps. He kept that carefully covered close to the caravan. It would be incredibly unusual for it to not be covered if if it wasn't in use. OK. Quad bike usually covered. Store that away. It's going to be important later on. Overall, one story is it's a picture of rustic tranquility. But there was no hiding from the other story about Brett still dealing drugs. Damien readily admitted it. He agreed his father was dealing in large amounts and his wallet was always fat full of cash. He said Brett wrapped drugs in cash in black bags and buried them in white plastic drums on his property. Damien says his dad was very hot on security. He installed a security camera on the Pitangi track to monitor people coming up to the campsite. Brett told him he was being spied on, but someone was taking his money. Was this just paranoia? Maybe fueled by the meth Brett was taking occasionally? Anyway, it looks like Brett had reason to be anxious that month. There was a big drug deal going down. Maybe two. One involved a mate of Brett's, who I've been calling Mr Pike. They met in prison, and there's good evidence they're involved in drug dealing together. Brett's mum, Lavona, told the court earlier that Brett was spending quite a lot of time with Mr Pike before Brett disappeared, including trips to Auckland together. And did he tell you they were fishing trips? Fishing, they were fishing trips, That's what yeah. Brett told you? Yes, yes. Okay. I don't think I'm going out on a limb in suggesting that fishing was probably not the main point of those trips. Damien says Brett had sold Mr Pike big bags of cannabis. And the week before he disappeared, Brett told Damien he was getting another big stash very soon. Uh, he said he had some, some good stuff on the way, yeah. Did that deal lead to Brett's death? The defence says this deal went down the very weekend Brett disappeared and something went badly wrong. Now we come to the crucial week, Thursday 26 May to Wednesday 1 June in 2011. On Thursday morning, something happens that might be very revealing or it might not matter much at all. I can't figure it out. It starts when Brett's neighbour, John Thurlow, notices a car outside his house. John Thurlow's house is opposite the bottom of the Pitangi track, so he can see the comings and goings to Brett's campsite. And there's a car sitting there. It's mid-morning, sometime around 10. John doesn't immediately recognise the car, so he wanders out for a look-see. Uh, well, I went over, but I didn't know who it was, and then I saw it was Dave, as I got close to the car, I said, oh, it's you, Dave. Yeah. What are you doing here? And he said, I'm waiting for the bullying inspector. Except for one thing, this was not remarkable at all. John Thurlow knew that David Little was building a house for Brett. David had been staying up there for the past few days. And as it happened, a building inspector had been booked to inspect Brett's house frame that Thursday so that David could start working on closing the house up. But there's that one thing. Earlier that morning, David had cancelled the building inspection. He phoned the council and told them the track was too wet. The building inspector was not coming, and David Little knew it. Here's the council officer he'd phoned up. Um, it had been raining heavily for like three days. The Tangy track is a very steep, muddy part of the Wanganui River Road, and um, yeah, both him and myself agreed that the, the conditions would not be suitable for a building officer to, um, to get up the track to do the, can, to do the inspection. So um, he suggested, or sorry, I suggested that, that he want to rebook it, and he said no, he would leave it for to probably next week for the track to dry out. Was David lying to John Furlow? If so, what was he trying to hide? 
He told police in a video interview that's not how he remembered their conversation. I'm there, I don't actually recall saying it, so I can't see the reason why I would. So I was off into town to do my bits and pieces. He says he had a chat to John Thurlow, then drove off into town. He only stopped briefly. Long enough to tell him. Oh, yeah, I always have a talk to John myself, yeah. yeah. But long enough to tell him that the reason you were there was that you were waiting for the building inspector. Yeah, I'd say he's just taken it the wrong way. Well, it's true that David did head off into town, and he insisted to police that Brett knew he'd cancelled the inspection. Did John Thurlow get it wrong? Here's Christopher Stevenson's cross-examination. And am I right that the um, two of you discussed the bad weather, that it had been rubbish, it had been raining? Do you recall that? A rural conversation on the side of the road probably to discuss the yes. bad weather. <laughs> Um, and, and that was the gist of the conversation, bad weather and there was going to be a wait on some building inspection. That was the, he the was guts of it, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Notice how Christopher Stevenson subtly shifts ground. Bad weather and there was going to be a wait on some building inspection. Maybe that's how the conversation went. That dang weather was causing more delays. Now the inspection couldn't even take place. They'd have to wait some more. That version of the conversation which is still about weather and waiting and the inspection, doesn't involve David saying he's waiting right then for a building inspector. And John Thurlow readily admits that the conversation was eight years ago and he didn't pay special attention to it at the time. Still, John Thurlow was sticking to his story. David told him he was waiting for the building inspector. What's more, later on a police officer said David talked to the police about the building inspector. He'd said to us that... Uh, the building inspector was supposed to come up to inspect something on the house on uh, Thursday, but he didn't turn up. Uh, Mr Little said uh, it was too wet for the inspector and he didn't arrive. Didn't arrive. That doesn't sound like what you'd say if you cancelled an inspection. But it does sound a bit like what John Thurlow says David told him, which again looks like He's hiding something. Still, David did tell police later that he'd cancelled the inspection. But if David Little lied to John Thurlow about waiting for the inspector, why? The Crown says he must have been lying to Brett as well. He must have told Brett that the inspector never turned up. Was David worried the house was going to fail the inspection because his work was so shoddy? Was he worried that Brett would get mad at him? This doesn't seem very likely. I won't wade through all the evidence about the quality of the building, but the upshot was that it was in good shape. I only needed a couple of very minor tweaks to pass inspection, jobs that would only take about an hour. So maybe David was worried that it would pass the building inspection and he'd have to come up with the money for the windows, which was the next stage of construction. That's more likely, but putting the inspection off for a week wasn't going to buy him much time. And what if Brett phoned the council to complain and found out that his own builder had cancelled the inspection? How much trouble would David be in then? Or was David worried that the inspector would come up and stumble on him killing Brett? But he didn't kill Brett, on the Thursday anyway. John Thurlow saw Brett and David at the campsite happily together the following morning, the Friday. So maybe David and Brett just decided to put the inspection off a bit because of all the rain, perhaps to put some finishing touches on the frame. And David just stopped his car for a ciggy or a beer, as he did sometimes, by the bottom of the Pitangi track. He couldn't rule it out. But nor could you rule out that there's something weird going on here. But I don't know what. Let's listen to what John Thurlow says about his visit to the campsite on the Friday morning. That's the day the Crown says David Little killed Brett. And uh, that's in the morning and the the first person you really encounter up there is uh, Mr Hall at the um, campsite? Yes. You have a chat with Mr Hall, everything's normal? Yes. Yep. Um, Dave, you've explained, Dave the Builder walks over after you arrive, yes. joins you two. Um, everything's very amicable. Yes. Dave didn't have a gun. Oh. Uh, Dave was his usual friendly self. The usual what, sorry? Friendly self. Yes. Yep. And Dave and Brett were getting on, happy enough, and just some general chit-chat. Yes. Yeah. John Thurlow left shortly after that. Now, of course, there was nothing to stop you coming back on that Friday morning, was there, up to that camp area? <laughs> no, not no. necessarily, and there's a way to tell. Yeah, but you could have appeared at any time, right? Yes. 
Would David run the risk of killing Brett when John Thurlow might have waltzed back up? Crown says so. And it says this is the last time Brett Hall was seen alive and well. But I guess that depends on whether you believe David Little. David says he drove home on Friday afternoon, but drove back and saw Brett again two days later, on Sunday morning. And the defence say someone else saw Brett alive after that too. A drug dealer who killed him. So now it's Saturday, and we're going to meet Brett's son Damien again. He and a couple of friends decided to head up to Brett's place early in the morning. They drove up that hairy old Pitangi track to the paddock at Kiwi Flat, with the house frame, the utes, and Brett's caravan campsite nestled among the trees. They wanted to get Brett's permission to do some hunting. But according to the Crown, Brett was already dead. When you got up to the campsite at Pitangi that Saturday morning, what did you find? Um, we found the campsite in, in a bizarre state. Um, the door to the dip to Dad's new plywood shed was open. Uh, the caravan door was open. He wasn't there, and and the quad bike was gone. Damien looked in the caravan. Was Brett there? Uh, obviously he wasn't. There was a gun bag on the floor, which was uh, an empty gun bag. Um, it was the only thing out of character I think I noticed. Had you seen that gun bag before? No, I hadn't. Damien noticed the ashes were mounted really high over the campfire. So I put my hand over it, um, and it was really cold and stone cold, so that told me that Dad, well, he hadn't had a fire that morning. He probably didn't cook dinner there the night before. Uh, the reason for that, actually, is because of the manuka firewood that he burnt. It, it burns for a long, long time. It stays hot for a long time. So Damien and his friends split up to look for Brett. They took separate tracks, and Damien rode Brett's motorcycle. There was no sign of him. By 9am, Damien was starting to get worried. But then... Joss started yelling out that he could see Dad's quad bike up on the hill. Um, and he pointed up to it, and I could see it as well, in and, uh, and a hill that we'd never, never been up before, so I hadn't thought to look there. The quad bike was parked on the top of a steep track, fairly close to the campsite, though you couldn't see it from there. At the trial, they called it the zigzag track. Yeah, but we'd located the quad bike, so I was feeling heaps better. I thought he's just off. Heck, I didn't know what he was doing, but the quad was there. To me, that was a sign that he was all right, so I felt a lot better, and we more or less packed up and left. Still, you have to wonder about this. Would Brett really have left his caravan open with a gun bag on the floor? Under his parole rules, he wasn't allowed guns, so this was evidence of a parole breach. Did Brett really go hunting? Or was all this staged to look like he'd gone hunting? If so, who did it? Now we're up to Sunday. David Little told police he got up early to go fishing. He got some petrol and bulls and then tried to get to the beach down a couple of roads near Turukina, which is about a quarter of an hour's drive north of Bulls. But the access was blocked. He parked his Nissan Turano up in a rest area just outside Turukina and had some drinks. He told police, and this is worth remembering, that he never went south of Bulls. Then he drove up to Brett's place to finish off the framing of the house. David definitely did go to Pitangi that morning. Brett's neighbour, John Thurlow, remembered seeing Dave arrive at Pitangi. He saw him again on the track, heading back down about an hour and a half later that morning. Here's a police officer reading David's statement about what happened that Sunday morning. I saw Brett. He was sitting around the campfire. We said hello and chit-chatted. Just talked the normal shit for a while around the campfire. I then drove up to the house we were building and did my bits and pieces there. He means he drove his ute across the paddock, probably a couple of hundred yards, to the house frame in the middle of Kiwi Flat. After doing some work, he says he drove back across the field and had a cup of tea with Brett. I saw Brett's quad bike parked between the fence and the track where it normally is. But it had been backed into its park, facing forwards towards the camp, rather than how it normally was. The cover was off the bike, which meant that he had either used it or was getting ready to use it, because Brett always had it covered when not in use. We talked about what he was getting up to for the rest of the day, and he just said that he was going to go for a hunt. This matters a lot. If David Little 
did see Brett on Sunday, the Crown's case falls over. The Crown says he killed Brett on Friday. But if David Little didn't see Brett on Sunday, then this is a huge lie, and it's hard to see an innocent explanation. Was he going back to check there was nothing incriminating at the site, having killed Brett on the Friday? Two days later, on Tuesday, John Thurlow visited the campsite, mustering his sheep through Brett's property, as he did. He didn't see Brett, but he did see something unusual by Brett's red Hilux. So as I drove the sheep around the front of the vehicle, there was a possum in a trap, still alive, uh, by the front of the vehicle. And that's just a bit, oh, that's unusual. Why is that unusual? Well, mostly because people who do trapping and stuff like that like to get out and <laughs> kill the possum or whatever as quickly as possible. And uh, I would have imagined that Brett was experienced in that kind of stuff and that would have been what he would have done. He also noticed some ashes in an unusual place, spread out on a piece of corrugated iron. Had you ever seen ashes on, on iron like that before up at the campsite? Oh, no. John Thurlow went back again a couple of times that evening, but... Nothing had changed. All right. Was the possum still there? Possum was still there. Like Damien did on Saturday, he checked the caravan, found the door open and a gun bag inside, but no sign of bread. He also checked the fireplace and found it very cold, and the quad bike was gone. Uh, well, I thought, well, something's not right here, so I shot the possum. And he went home and called the police. Brett's family are told that Brett's missing. Damien joins police at Pitangi on Wednesday morning. Brett's mother Lavona and younger brother Michael head up there on Wednesday evening. They find the quad bike gone, the caravan door unlocked, an empty rifle case on the floor. Michelle Wilkinson-Smith asks Damien how it looks compared to when he visited on the Saturday when he couldn't find his father. Very similar from memory. Was the gun bag in the same position? I would say it was there. It was in a very obvious position. Like many moments in a nine-week trial, it's easy to let this one slip by. Why does it matter? But actually, it's a big deal. If the caravan and the campsite looked the same on Wednesday as it did when Damien visited four days earlier on Saturday, it's hard to think that Brett went back there after Damien's visit. Why would he come back, do his stuff, then take off again later, leaving everything exactly the same as it was before, including an open caravan with a gun bag on the floor? And that quad bike in the same place up the zigzag path? And if Brett never came back after Saturday, that means Brett was probably killed on Friday. And that David Little was lying about seeing him on Sunday. Still, there were some things that looked a bit different from when Damien visited on Saturday. One was those ashes on the corrugated iron, which Damien hadn't seen on Saturday, but which John Thurlow saw a couple of days later. Michael Hall says he saw them too. Had someone been sifting through the ash, maybe to check that there were no telltale remnants? What had been burned? As ever, there's another story you can tell about the ashes. David Little told police it was Brett who put them there because he'd been burning old computer parts for fun and didn't want to stink up his cooking. And some computer bits were found in the ashes. At first he said he thought Brett moved the ashes on Thursday or Friday, but then he said it might have been on the Sunday. If it was the Sunday... That would explain why Damien didn't see them on the Saturday. Had you ever seen ash spread out like that before at the PT no. farm? No, Brett kept his camp site very clean and tidy. The ash was in the way, so Michael tipped it along the fence line. And there was another thing that stood out when Lavona and Michael first arrived at the campsite. Mum and I both noticed there were four chairs out when we got up there. Damien didn't see four chairs out when he visited on Saturday. Michael says the chairs were odd since Brett kept a very tidy campsite and whenever he visited... Brett always got out just the right number of chairs and put them away the moment Michael and his family left. And so I, I says to Dave, um, who, who come up with you? Because there were four chairs out. And, you know, so someone must come up with you. And he go, and Mr Little says, no, there was only two chairs. And I said, when Mum and I got up here, there were four chairs. So somebody must have been up here, here with you on Sunday. And uh, Mr Little got quite quite shitty with that, and then he... Didn't say nothing, nothing after that. I don't know. This seems pretty helpful to David. It looks like maybe others visited Pitangi after David left on Sunday. Could that have been part of the drug deal? Did they take Brett with them, willingly or not? I suppose it's possible someone, maybe David, put them there as part of staging the scene. 
but the rest of the scene was about Brett going off hunting. She just didn't really fit with that. And if David put the chairs out, you'd think he wouldn't have been getting shitty. He'd have been saying, hey, looks like some people visited Brett after me. Because David Little was pointing the finger at Brett's drug dealing friends. He told one police officer that Mr Pike and Brett had done drug deals together and seemed to have one coming up just before he disappeared. He said Brett and Mr Pike were going to buy some particularly good dope called AK-47 from a guy upriver who I'll call Mr Salmon. This seems to be the same deal that Damien said Brett told him about. David said Mr Pike had a violent history and would stand over people taking what he wants. He told police his theory was that someone had taken Brett from Pitangi and gone somewhere and a drug deal must have gone wrong. He said he didn't have any proof of this, but he knew that Brett would never get in a car with someone he didn't know or trust. For his part, Mr Pike was pointing the finger at David Little. He was telling Brett's mother, Lavona, that he wanted to smash David over to get a confession. And Mr Pike was curiously insistent on helping with the search when Brett went missing. Here's Detective Carl Rayland, one of the first police on the scene. He confronted me and told me, I am going to look for Brett. Was he, did he eventually go and look for Mr? No, I told him we have searches in the area and we didn't want him to go in and muck up what we were doing. He said, I'm going in, um, in an assertive way. And I confronted him and said, if you attempt to even begin searching, I'll arrest you. Did he go searching? He backed down straight away. You might be surprised that the police were precious about the search. But it's a big operation to search nearly a thousand hectares of craggy bush. We heard lots of evidence about it. The search went on for about 80 days on and off, most intensively in the first two weeks. There were 129 searches at its height, crawling over the land for a total of nearly 35,000 hours. There were expert search and rescue teams, tracker dogs, ab sailors, a heat-seeking helicopter. As Detective Rayland says, they expected to find Brett. In all of my years of search and rescue, we have never not found anyone. I was, it was just a matter of time before we found him. What did they find? Here's Senior Sergeant Darcy Forrester, who was in charge of the search. We found no evidence, nothing. We had not found no trails, no discarded items, no uh, information about anything. We, we saturated the area with every search method that was available to us in 2011. We used every available search team with specialised skills to go to every particular location that anybody could possibly get to in any given situation, if they were wandering off, if they were hunting, if they were disorientated, and even if they were disposed of. So therefore, based on my experience and all of that evidence, I stand by that Mr Hall was not in that area when we started our searching on the 1st of June 2011. As part of the search, Police used luminol to test for blood. This can pick up biological material as small as one millionth of a grain of salt. Nothing. No evidence pointing toward Brett being killed up at Pitangi. A police dog handler did stumble across a buried bucket containing drugs and $14,000 in cash that Brett had probably put there. But that's all. They didn't even find any guns, though David Little told police where Brett used to stash them. Here's a police officer reading a statement David gave him that first week of the search. Brett had two firearms. One was a .22, the other was a .223. Brett used to shoot goats and sometimes a deer. Brett used to keep the guns by the long drop. I have showed the police where that is. It's just down a steep bank a little along from the campsite. I did not see the guns on the Sunday when I was there. I do know the guns are not legal, that's why he did not tell anyone about them. They were hot, but I don't know where he got them from. Detective Rayland wasn't sure David would want to show police where Brett kept his guns. I knew he was in an awkward position and that he was actually getting uh, Mr Hall in trouble by showing me where these firearms were because we expected to find uh, Mr Hall and then after that we would have to be speaking to him about firearms that Mr Little had told us about. This was a breach of Brett's parole conditions, remember. Could have put him back in jail. I was concerned that Mr Little would get in trouble with the family if they found out he had told us. So what did you do? I took Mr Little aside 
um, we were still within view of the family who was sitting around the barbecue or around the caravan. And I did that deliberately so I was out of earshot and I very quietly said to Mr Little, could you take me to where the firearms were? Um, I was surprised. Mr Little said quite loudly, in fact loud enough for the family to hear easily, um, that he knew all about the firearms and they were down the bank. Did David know that Brett wasn't coming back? Besides the guns, there's one very interesting thing that police didn't find up at Pitangi. It's about the quad bike. Remember, Damien saw it at the top of the zigzag track on Saturday. David Little said it was back at the campsite when he visited Brett on Sunday. But police found it up on the zigzag track after Brett was reported missing. Brett's brother later told them he'd seen Brett taking the quad bike up there sometimes to check on his possum traps. There are also footprints going into the bush. It's possible Brett had money or drugs hidden there somewhere. Anyway, a couple of days into the search, police called in an expert military tracking team, headed by Sergeant Major Clive Douglas. They examined the quad bike and the grass around it and the track leading up to it. They were looking for pointers like flattened grass showing which way it had travelled. They also looked at worm castings. Apparently bits of squashed worm dung are gold for trackers because, unlike grass, they don't spring back again. Um, you could see at the, you know, we had driven it in terms of the flattening and the pointers. That have been driven up the hill? Yes. Were there any pointers for return tracks coming back down the hill? We didn't, we didn't see anything of that nature. So from your examination and experience, what conclusion did you reach about that quad bike? That it had only been gone up there once and it hadn't been moved. Uh, in particular the, within the last 10 days. The defence pressed him about the springiness of the grass, the time that had passed, the effects of the weather. Might it be possible that the signs of the quad bike coming and going had just worn off? But the Sergeant Major stuck to his guns. Were there any other tracks that had led to that ridge line in the previous 10 days? When you look at where the quad bike is located, and then if it had been moved, what sign would you likely to see based on that age period? And based on what we um, saw, the facts that we saw on the ground, we made the assessment, and it is based on our professional military judgment and our experience of 25 years at that point, that that quad bike hadn't been moved in the last, within that last 10, um, 10, excuse me, 10 days. You've probably figured out why I'm spending so long on this. If the quad bike only went up once, that looks very bad for David Little. Remember, Damien said he saw it up on the zigzag track on Saturday, and David said he saw it back at the campsite on Sunday. It was definitely up on the zigzag track on the Wednesday when police found it. If it only went up once and stayed there, and it was there on Saturday, then it wasn't back at the campsite on Sunday when David visited. Was David mistaken? Or did he put the quad bike up there on Friday to make it look like Brett had gone hunting and lie about seeing it on Sunday? After all, he didn't know that anyone had seen the campsite and spotted the quad bike on Saturday, so it might have seemed like a safe lie. Does that also mean Brett was never there on Sunday? Was David lying about that too? If that's what you think, then you need to take a listen to this next witness, who might just upend the whole case. Mr Little meets Mr Big is an RNZ production, written and presented by me, Stephen Price, with support from Victoria University of Wellington and the Michael and Suzanne Boren Foundation. Justin Gregory and Katie Gossett are the executive producers. Tim Watkin is the executive producer of podcasts and series for RNZ. Thanks to sound engineers Blair Stagpool, Phil Benj, Mark Chesterman, Rangi Powick and William Saunders. Jeremy Ansel and Steve Burridge are the Auckland and Wellington operations team leaders. Music composed and performed by Ebony Lamb and Graham Antler. Images by Ebony Lamb. Artwork and design by Jared Bishop and RNZ. You can listen and follow all RNZ podcasts at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Listener.